last time, we found out that Tarzan's parents, Lord and Lady Greystoke, were stranded somewhere on the coast of Africa by Black Michael and his band of less than merry men. Lord Greystoke, John Clayton, built a shelter in the trees so they could keep away from ground predators. Their safety hammock gets old pretty darn quick, though, and over the course of a month, John builds a sturdy little shack on the beach. He fortifies the house with window gratings and a self-latching lock, insulates it with four inches of clay, and he decorates it with a fireplace and ship junk. They were even starting to feel pretty happy and managed to tune out the snarling and growling of the creatures that would come around to sniff at the cabin. They were comfy there. Too comfy. In the month or so since they'd been stranded, they spotted the spooky beast that had frightened Alice only three times. However, they were never close enough to the creatures to be able to tell if they were human or something else. Only that they were to be feared. But the Claytons were too comfy to be overcome by the spookies, and their positive energy was strong enough to attract the local birds. The friendly flyers were so comfortable with the Claytons that they would even eat out of their hands. One afternoon, while John is out getting supplies for an addition to their cabin, their bird friends come bolting through the trees, going cuckoo bananas! And that's when John spots what scared the birds. An ape? A man? No! An anthropoid! It barked and grunted as it made its way toward him, occasionally dragging its knuckles on the floor. You'll recall that earlier, I mentioned that the Claytons had become too comfy in their cozy cabin life. And by that I meant that John started feeling like he didn't need no stinking gun weighing him down in the daytime. After all, it isn't like any predators on the African continent hunt in the daylight. That kind of thinking bit him right in the butt, because the anthropoid was standing right between John and his escape route back to the cabin. Which, by the way, since he'd been feeling so complacent, was a considerable distance away. Ah, uh, he never learns, does he? However, he manages to see an opportunity and get past the beast and starts running toward the cabin, yelling to Alice, who was sitting outside. She hears him and looks up to see the anthropoid right on his heels, grabbing for her husband's head. By the time John got close to the house, Alice was inside. He yells for her to shut and bolt the door, but she refuses. The anthropoid looked to be at least 300 pounds and it wasn't going to easily be taken down by John's axe. As John prepares to fight, he notices Alice come out of their house holding one of his rifles. You may recall that in my previous video, I mentioned that Alice seemed to have lived a real privileged life. Because of that, she'd grown up completely afraid of firearms and never touched one. So you can imagine the sight of her pointing one in his direction isn't something John is super stoked about. He cries for Alice to go back. Back, Alice! For God's sake, go back! The anthropoid charged with all his might. Clayton responded with a swing of his axe. But it was all for nothing as the creature grabs the axe out of the nobleman's hands and chucks it away. But just as he reaches out to the frightened man on the ground to tear out his throat, a loud crack rings out as Alice shoots it in the back. The giant anthropoid throws John to the ground and starts going after Alice as she tries to shoot again. But not understanding how to eject the empty cartridge before the next shot, she struggles with the gun. As the beast looms over her, she faints because she's a terrified white woman in this book. Thankfully, John manages to get to his feet and lunges at the beast and the bull anthropoid falls dead, finally succumbing to the bullet. He picks up Alice and it takes her two hours before she regains consciousness. She's unharmed physically, but it quickly becomes clear that, psychologically, irreparable damage was done. Oh, John, it is so good to really be home. I had an awful dream, dear. I thought we were no longer in London, but in some horrible place where great beasts attacked us. 
He realizes what's happened and comforts her. There, there, Alice. Try to sleep again. And do not worry your head about bad dreams. Of all the nights, it is this night that Tarzan, yet to be named so, is born as a leopard screams outside their door. A year goes by and Alice never recovers her sanity. She never again leaves the cabin and she never again believes she isn't in England. She questions their surroundings often and though John tries to remind her of their circumstances, she never comes to terms with reality. On the bright side, she loves being a mother, and because she isn't worried about the dangers of the real world around her, her joy is uninhibited, and John is almost glad she isn't aware of her surroundings. The bright sides of mental illness, you never do hear quite enough about it. In the meantime, John gives up on ever being rescued and keeps working to make their cabin super cute inside even going so far as to sculpt vases and fill them with flowers. Throughout the year, he's more frequently attacked by the anthropoids, but that goody-goody Greystoke wasn't caught in the jungle again without his goody-goody guns. He creates a super special lock for the door and adds more fortification to the windows to prevent the beasts from attacking Alice and the baby. He regularly reads to his little family, and he keeps a diary in French for a reason that isn't mentioned. I assume it has something to do with his time in the service, but whatever. He keeps the little book in a metal box for safety. Things weren't looking so bad on the coast they'd come to call home. A way of life had been established, and everyone seemed to be getting along just fine. And then Alice died in the night, on her son's first birthday. Her passing was quiet, and it was hours before John noticed she'd passed away. He wrote in his diary about it the next morning. His hopelessness overtakes him, and he lays nearly as motionless as she does, with his crying son nearby. Geez, that's all so sad. I gotta take a break from this bummer. Thankfully, the author felt the same way, and we get to take a look at what the anthropoids are up to. Deep in the jungle, Kerchak the Anthropoid is being a total D-bag and going on a rampage. All the members of his tribe do their best to avoid his powerful punches, but one unlucky Anthrofella gets whapped and snapped in the big bull's jaws. A lady Anthropoid falls from a tree and he reduces her to a bloody mess on the forest floor. And then, he spots Kala coming back with her baby. You may have guessed that this book isn't at all like the Disney picture. Kerchak might have been a jerk in the movie, but in this one, he's got no connection to Kala, and therefore, no reason to stop him from turning her into gloopy globs. She manages to rapidly climb a tree, but in doing so, she drops her baby. She tries to drop down and save him, but she quickly realizes that he's dead and sits sadly with him on the floor. Even Kerchak decides this isn't a time to be a jerk and leaves her be. Let's take a break from the gloom here for a second and have a cryptozoology lesson. The anthropoids are a little bit like something between a gorilla and a human. However, one anthropoid to the next can look very different. Kerchak is described as having a low receding brow with bloodshot eyes that are small and close set. He has a flat nose and large, thin ears that are smaller than most of the others of his kind. Kala is described as being a splendid member of her species. She's large with long, clean limbs and a round, high forehead, which denoted more intelligence than most of her kind possessed. She's also said to have a great capacity for mother love and mother sorrow. This way of thinking is also a sign of the times. Forehead length and ear size somehow was associated with intelligence when this book was written, but not so much anymore. <laughs> the anthropoids are often referred to as apes in the book, which can only really get confusing when gorillas are around, but that doesn't happen too often. Speaking of gorillas, the anthropoids seem to be similar to them socially in that the males have more than one female love buddy. However, unlike gorillas, the female anthropoids seem to be monogamous to their male love buddies. 
This isn't mentioned clearly in the book, but I thought it was nice for you to have for context. That's all for the cryptozoology lesson. Let's get back to the story. While Kala mourns her baby, the rest of the anthropoids drop down from the trees and Kerchak calls them around for a group trip to the beach. On the way there, Kala refuses to let go of her baby's body, which I imagine was ruining the beach trip vibe. The tribe is made up of about 60 or 70 apes, <coughs> minus the ones that Kerchak killed. <laughs> By noon, they arrive near the Clayton's cottage. Kerchak glares at it from the top of the ridge overlooking the beach. He hates John and his guns, who have been responsible for the deaths of several members of his tribe. Which was probably totally in self-defense, but that's besides the point. While he's stewing in his anger, he notices that the front door is open. They approach the cabin quietly, believing that the gun which they referred to as the little black stick, would wake up and kill them with its signature roar. Kerchak and two of the other males carefully walk into the cabin with Kala watching them from the door. Inside, they see John, whom they call the White Ape, still laying on his desk, Alice's body covered by a sailcloth on the bed, and their son crying in his crib. As Kerchak prepares to charge John, Lord Greystoke rises to his feet and faces the group of anthropoids. He freezes in horror and is unable to get to his gun before Kerchak kills him. The big bad bull anthropoid turns to finish off the last remnants of the white apes who invaded their cool beach, but Kala launches into the cabin and nabs the baby, dropping the body of her own lifeless baby into the crib. She bolts out of the house, climbs up into a tall tree, and baby Greystoke finally stops crying, soothed by the kind mama anthropoid. She nurses him while the rest of the apes go through the Clayton stuff, which I'm sure a lot of you think is really gross, but most of us drink cow's milk, so you're pretty much all doing the same thing. Be thankful to the cow mamas. Kerchak tries to kill Alice, but is super bummed when he finds out that she's already dead. He gingerly approaches the rifle on the wall, afraid it'll go off and hurt him. He paces in front of it, too afraid to pick it up, despite his belief that it probably can't hurt anyone without someone using it. He growls and screams so piercingly, the author writes that there was no sound more terrifying in all the jungle. He almost touches it, but he doesn't. He reaches out again and then stops after touching it. Then finally he reaches out and takes the rifle, stares down the barrel, examines it carefully with his eyes and hands, and almost f***ing shoots himself when his finger catches the trigger. Immediately after blowing out his and the ears of those around him, Kerchak and his tribesmen bolted out of the cabin, accidentally shutting the door behind them, causing the latch to lock, and keeping them out forever. The apes try to find another way back in, but aren't able to crack John Clayton's puzzle. Kala finally comes down from the tree now that Kerchak doesn't seem to mind her on-the-spot adoption, and the anthropoids return to their foresty home. Any apes that try to approach Kala's new weird baby are repelled by threats from her. She bares her teeth and growls at them, even when they try to convince her that they won't hurt him at all. Realizing that Tarzan was more delicate than her other baby, she always holds him close to her, even while she's walking and climbing among the trees. And that concludes chapters three and four of Tarzan of the Apes. And man, Talk about drama! So much doom and gloom and heartbreak, Tarzan's origins are seldom covered, but in my opinion, this is one of the most interesting things about this story. It's deep and sad and explains a lot of motivations, and I'm glad I got to share it with you. Next time, we'll get to see Tarzan start to grow into the vine-swinging superhero everyone knows and loves. Thanks for watching!